Well, hello again. Welcome and good morning. My name is Jessica Stokes and I'm on the Partners in Health and Wholeness team with the North Carolina Council of Churches. And we're so grateful you are sharing this December 1st with us. I cannot believe it's December 1st and that we're here. This year has flown by, it seems. And with that, how appropriate to talk about how chaotic and frantic the holidays can feel. I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. And I know for many of us, we are quickly being ushered into a busy holiday season into throughout the New Year's and so forth. And so um, it's a busy time. And what better conversation for today with our friend Travis Jeffords on moving from frantic doing to sacred being, how to find rest in the holidays and beyond. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. We'll do the next slide. So the agenda today is simply welcome, hello from Partners in Health and Wholeness, our presentation, and later today we'll have a chance for questions and answers. I do ask that uh, please stay muted. During the presentation, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand on the Zoom feature or put your question in the chat and we will share it later. Or simply say in the chat that you would like to share something or say uh, say whatever and we will, we will find a chance for you to do that. And so we appreciate that cooperation. And um, again, we're just so grateful you're here. Partners in Health and Wholeness team, we've got a good bit of our team here. I know Alicia is here, Elizabeth is here, Stephanie is here, and I uh, apologize if other team members are here, but I know I know for sure of the PHW team that's that's who's here. And if, if um, you will, please let's pause together for a moment of centering to, to help us find some footing in today so that we can be present together. So please pray with me. God of hope and love, thank you for today, God. Help center us, God, so that we can be present together, so that we can learn together, so that we can be together. By being present and mindful, God, and by learning, we can better support ourselves so that we can also support our communities. Help us take care of ourselves, God, when we're feeling exhausted, when, when we feel maxed out, when we feel like we can't do much more for much longer. I pray that you will help us, God, as you always do, God. Help give us strength and resilience and help give us the reminder that you are always with us, God. And for that, even in the most chaotic seasons and busy and stressful seasons, we know that you are with us, helping us, guiding us, and we are never alone. And for that, God, we give thanks. Thank you for today. Thank you for Travis. Thank you for this opportunity to learn more and so that we can live into this. And all this we pray, amen. Thank you. So I'm so grateful uh, to introduce our speaker. His name is Travis Jeffords, and he's a North Carolina licensed clinical mental health counselor and a national certified counselor. Travis works on staff as a licensed counselor at Sanctuary Counseling Group and has led contemporary worship for the United Methodist Church for the last 15 years. Travis completed his master's in science with a focus on clinical mental health counseling from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro and a master of divinity from Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. Travis also spent time as a hospital chaplain intern in the Indiana University Hospital System and holds an undergraduate degree in music composition from Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. So thank you, Travis, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to pass it on to you and uh, thank you again. Cool. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so uh, yeah, so I work at Sanctuary Counseling Group and just like the um, quick 90 second pitches that we do um, mental health counseling all around North Carolina through telehealth. 
Um, it's a really diverse staff. So um, like black, white, young, old, male, female. Um, and it is, um, all of them are state board licensed counselors who are also Christians, um, which is really unique and cool. So probably about half of them like used to be pastors earlier and then felt um, a different call. Uh, and we also, oh, thanks, Jessica. Yeah. And we also um, raise money so that people who can't afford counseling um, can can see us and get counseling at a reduced rate, which is really cool. So um, yeah, so I'm just going to be talking a little bit. Um, and when I think about the busyness and craziness of the holidays, I always remember um, that Amy Grant song, I Need a Silent Night from a few years ago. Um, it was like a hit um, for a while. And um, the lyrics are, I've made the same mistake before, too many malls, too many stores, December traffic, Christmas rush, it breaks me till I push and shove. Children are crying and mothers are trying to photograph Santa and sleigh, the shopping and buying and standing forever in line. What can I say? I need a silent night, a holy night to hear an angel voice through the chaos and the noise. I need a midnight clear, a little peace right here to end this crazy day with a silent night. Um, and so that gives like uh, a secular perspective and then um, for many of us involved in church work or, or active in the church, there are all these other things that we're doing, um, preparing events. Um, and so, um, yeah, what would it look like to find a little rest here? Um, and to me, the holiday season is often, it can be like runners sprinting at the end of the marathon. Um, we're tired and exhausted from running around nonstop all year. And then we're asked, um, to run even faster at the end when we've got nothing left to give. Um, and so if we're honest, we find that the sprint of Advent and Christmas is unsustainable, but in truth, it's kind of all been unsustainable. So what does it look like um, to do it in a sustainable way? And so I'll just talk about kind of three different things. Um, one is how our theological beliefs and what it, what it, our ideas about what it means to follow God and be with God inform our ability um, to value and prioritize rest. Um, two, just mention what some possible healthy rhythms of rest look like. And then three, um, what some deeper uh, boundary issues and psychological issues are that often sabotage people's ability to engage in ministry sustaining self-care. Um, and so, um, yeah, just to let you know, uh, these are just things I've read, my opinions. And so it's fine if you're like, 90% of this, I don't agree with 10% of this maybe has some use in my life. Take the 10%. Don't worry about the 90%. Um, you won't offend me in any way. Um, yeah. So moving on to theological beliefs. Um, one of the phrases that they repeated over and over again when I was in seminary was the Bible is a library, not a book. So meaning a, the Bible is made up of 66 books, but also the Bible's not a book of systemic theology. So it was written over this period of like 1500 years, reflects various theologies and understandings of God during those various times. Um, and, so, um, and so I want to acknowledge that yes, there definitely are verses in the Bible that seem to advocate for and valorize a life that's lived on the edge of burnout. And maybe you've heard those verses before, um, I think oftentimes pastors or churches really focus on verses like in Romans, um, where, uh, where it talks about our bodies being living sacrifices, or where Mark talks about the son of man coming not to serve, not to be served, but to serve, or the Pauline letters frequently talk about running the race for the prize. And so some people or groups really take away um, uh, from these verses a theme of self-sacrifice, duty, and responsibility. So the idea that to be faithful means going nonstop as hard as you can every day, as long as you can. And that's really what faith looks like. And so, um, yeah, I want to just open it up. Um, and if you have any other um, kind of verses or, or um, yeah, things in the Bible that you've heard preached that kind of give this message, um, feel free to share. Um, yeah.
Okay, cool. Well, I'll just keep going. Um, and so uh, really quickly, I just want to add, I think there's a distinction between doing something difficult or hard because your heart and soul really believe in it. Um, wandering in the wilderness. Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks, Ben. Yeah. So um, distinction between doing something difficult or hard because your heart and soul believe in it and you believe God is calling you to do that on one hand. And then this idea of self-sacrifice on the other hand, which according to me means continually doing what our hearts don't really want to do out of a sense of shame or obligation. So I believe the former way, like doing hard things that we want to do, that we believe we're called to do, can lead to joy and is sustainable over a lifetime. The latter way, doing what you don't want to do um, out of a sense of shame or obligation, I don't think that can be sustained over a whole lifetime without consequences to your physical health, your spiritual health, your mental health, and your family's health. Um, but a lot of people have this idea, um, a lot of good Christians like have this idea, either subconsciously or consciously, um, that being a good Christian means doing what your heart doesn't really want you to do. Um, when they're living uh, without any boundary issues and they're saying yes to anything and everyone, even things they really want to say no to, but they feel guilty or like um, like they're not doing what Jesus would do if they said no to someone. I don't think um, everyone thinks that explicitly, but I've worked with enough pastors to know that those are the thoughts that are often kind of rumbling around in the background. Um, and so then there are these uh, these other scriptures uh, that come to mind as well to seem to suggest that a life lived in union with God is somehow different than maybe what we've been told by others or what we've interpreted ourselves. So maybe the spiritual life is about something different than dutifully doing what we don't really want to. And so there's other scriptures like um, Jesus says, uh, come to me all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. Um, and then it says, and you will find rest in your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's one of those. Um, or I'm thinking of the, oh yeah, Paul. Oh, that's great, uh, Andrea. Yeah, all things to all people. Yes, that's that's often used to to talk about working yourself to death. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah, or I'm thinking about um, places in the Gospels where Jesus withdraws from crowds in order to pray and reconnect with God. And it wasn't until I actually started doing ministry in the church that I noticed that and read it, and it just popped out. Um, even Jesus pulls away to pray. Um, or I'm thinking of the commandment uh, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Um, Jesus's profound statement quoting Hosea in Matthew 9, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Um, I'm thinking of Paul who says in Corinthians 13, if I give away all I have and deliver my body to be burned and have not love, I am nothing. Um, or the famous story of Mary and Martha, and there are tons of different interpretations of that story, but one of the interpretations that we often talk about in the church is the importance and value of spending time just being with Jesus instead of frantically and manically doing, doing, doing. So if you can think of any other verses like that that kind of advocate or speak to a different way of being, that's not based on um, uh, valorizing doing what we actually don't want to do, um, but something different, then feel free to put that in the chat as well. Um, and I just wanna share two brief uh, paragraphs from uh, Franciscan writer, Richard Rohr. <clears throat> and I just want you to notice what comes up for you. And so you may think he's right on the mark, or you may think he's way off base, and deeply distorting the gospel message, but just, just notice it and notice what comes up for you and what assumptions he may be challenging. So this is what he says. In another book, Declaring God is Well, yeah. Oh, that's great, yeah. I love that comment in the chat, yeah, before he did anything. Okay, in another book, I call it The Myth of Sacrifice. Sacrifice usually leads to a well-hidden sense of entitlement and perpetuates the vicious circle of merit, a mindset that leads most of us to assume that we are more deserving than others because we have given or done. 
As the old saying goes, all expectations and self-sacrifice are just resentments waiting to happen. Jesus came to end all false sacrificial notions, I believe, and he did it once and for all. But the ego and egoic culture led us right back into it, probably because the false self feels so unworthy that it must earn a sense of worthiness through some notion of heroism or hard work. Even rich white men who are born into their money will somehow let you know how much they sacrificed to get what they have. When you sacrifice, you always deserve. Um, sacrifice, much more than we care to admit, creates entitlement, a you owe me attitude, and a well-hidden sense of superiority. Jesus brilliantly said, go, learn the meaning of the words, what I want is mercy and not sacrifice. Yeah. So just notice um, kind of what, um, what's come up for you as I read that. And then here's another bit um, from Eugene Rod from Gene Rogers, who's a professor at um, UNCG um, in one of his books. He says, obedience, uh, he's talking about um, Ansel's understanding of Christ's obedience, but he says, obedience in this case does not mean that God the Son knuckles under the authority of the Father. It means that Christ remains obedient to the mission of the whole Trinity to repair the broken image, remains obedient to his own commitment to solidarity with a human being. In this, Christ obedience is like that of Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., an obedience to a joint cause, not an obedience to an external authority. Um, so that's another thing to play with. And for me, um, the difference between a joint cause engaging in a dream and in work that we share together in God and an external authority, which I read as meaning engaging in work that if I honestly don't want to do it, but I feel I have to do it, it hits differently inside. I mean, I, like it physically feels different um, when I think of those. Yeah, I can send that reference, Sophia. Um, actually, do I know the reference? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, I'll send that. Um, Mm -mm. I'll keep going. Yeah. So if we believe uh, that following Jesus or knowing God calls us to a different way of being in the world, one where we value the healthy longings and desires that God has placed inside us for rest, renewal, stillness, contemplation, reflection, being, instead of frantic and manic doing despite our exhaustion. If we see those things as holy and sacred values, then we're going to do ministry um, in a much different way. And I believe uh, in a result that, that it will result in a different kind of mental health state for you, your family, and your church. Um, yeah, so that's part one. Um, and then part two is kind of just some healthy rhythms. Um, so I'm just going to list some and then just imagine um, what it would look like for you to do just one of these things. Maybe all of these things aren't possible right away, but what is like one kind of rhythm of rest? So there are daily rhythms, like a 30 to 60 minute lunch break where you weren't also working and checking emails like during your lunch break. Um, but we're doing something um, like mindfully eating um, a short prayer walk even if it's just five to 15 minutes where you walked around your church or your neighborhood and just breathed and noticed um, what is happening in you and in your neighborhood. Um, yeah, lighting a candle in the evening. Advent is a great time to light candles. We light candles in Advent um, and just spending time in prayer or, or in stillness or in contemplation. Um, yeah, so there are those daily activities. And um, <clears throat> I would say um, so much of what we do, there, there's a lot of uh, things we do to stimulate ourselves. So like TikTok videos, TV, whatever, like we're, we're stimulated, but maybe that's not the same thing as being fulfilled and nourished um, and coming into contact with the divine in us and around us. Um, weekly rhythms of rest, um, what would it look like to actually have a day or maybe even two days off each week? Um, yeah, not doing sermon prep, no phone calls, no meetings, no emails, just actually resting. 
um, what it would look like to have several nights a week with nothing on your calendar. Um, no meetings, no small groups, no football games to like network and meet people in the community, just like at home with you or your family. Um, and I know um, for any anyone that's like bivocational pastors, um, this can seem like an impossibility, um, but it's still important to find some way to find a rhythm of rest. Um, there are monthly and quarterly rhythms of rest. So regular times when you're not preaching or involved on Sunday, doing something for your church on Sunday. Um, if you're a pastor, um, yeah, what would it look like to ask someone else to preach, an associate pastor, a youth director? Um, yeah, and, and if uh, a special guest, and if this bothers you, I'd be asking to myself, like, what is it about me that makes me think I'm the only one that has something to say about God in this entire church. You know, what is, what's going on there? Um, am I nervous that someone else would do better than me? Um, is it some prideful part? Like, what is it that seems like I'm the only one that can say something about God? Um, regular times when you leave town, doesn't have to be a luxurious vacation, but you know, like, as soon as you physically leave, something releases, you know, just getting out of town, um, spending time with friends out of town at their house. That's super cheap. Going camping is super cheap. Um, but just getting out of town, um, and then having, um, like taking sick days and mental health days when you need those. Um, and again, just noticing like, um, uh, what are ways that you can delegate some of these things to other people or find someone else to help you with them. And if you're hesitate, hesitant to delegate to others, that's something to explore more with someone like a counselor, or a mentor, like what's behind that? What's going on? Um, why, why are you afraid you can't hand these things off to someone else? Um, um, and then annual rhythms of rest, like what would it look like to take two weeks of vacation a year? And vacation is not sermon writing time. It's just vacation. Um, and then time for sermon writing time also. Um, and what would it look like to have an actual sabbatical? Um, I have a friend who's a church planner um, and bivocational. And uh, in the summer, he has a small congregation and he said, all right, we're just doing house groups. I need the summer off. And he would go to a house group and his church didn't meet for like three months. They met in house groups and they came back and it was fine. And he was rested and he could continue to do the work that he feels called to do. Um, yeah, and so um, if I would just say, and um, maybe there'll be questions about this, like if you feel pressure from your congregation, like I can't do these things, they don't want me to do these things. Um, yeah, I would, I would say, what would it look like for you to start to have conversations about rest and renewal with your community um, to slowly change that culture? Um, but for many people, um, yeah, for many pastors, like maybe you've heard these things before and you like know these things, but there's something different about actually implementing it. Um, and so setting aside times of rest will mean saying no to doing some things and no to some people who are accustomed to you saying yes to them. Um, and this is where the counselor part in me comes out. Um, often before being able to take a step towards creating firmer boundaries around our time, we have to do the deeper psychological work of understanding what is inside of me that's keeping that from happening. Um, like when the phone rings at dinner and it's a member of your church, what is that voice that tells you to pick up the phone in the middle of dinner time saying to you, like, where did that voice come from? What is that voice afraid will happen if you waited till after dinner or the next morning to call someone back? When you do try to take a day off of work, um, do you find yourself like nervously checking email and doing sermon prep anyway? Um, does it feel uncomfortable? Like you're not sure what to do if you're not always doing something at all times like what's what's going on there um some of us in the church have been known to look down at people with alcohol or substance abuse issues as being immoral or um sinners but we have to look at our own addictions like workaholism um or like rescue like trying to rescue people all the times and maybe those are a kind of addictions that we also um need to be mm, need to seek help from. Um, 
when your church, again, like when your church used to have two Christmas Eve services 30 years ago, but now you could fit it all into a single Christmas Eve service, like what's going on that's keeping us from making the change of simplifying our own life and the whole church's life to going into a, a single service, something like that. Um, when you can't take a vacation to see your family during the holidays, could you feel like you have to preach or be at church every moment, all December? Um, yeah, what is going on inside of you that's keeping you from finding creative ways of bringing other people in? Um, and I heard this great story from the Indian Jesuit priest and psychotherapist, Anthony DeMello. Um, he's really great. Um, so here's the quote. Um, there's a Jesuit friend of mine who said to me, anytime I see a beggar or a poor person, I cannot not give him alms. Like I have to give him alms or money. Um, I got that from my mother. His mother would offer a meal to any poor person who passed by. I said to him, Joe, what you have is not a virtue. What you have is a compulsion, a good one from the point of view of the beggar, but a compulsion nonetheless. And so sometimes pastors, like all people, we can use our theological beliefs to come up with fancy ways of justifying a continuation of burnout behavior, quoting scripture about sacrifice and talking about living like Jesus. But the reality is people who are unable to set boundaries in a healthy way are not living their best life. In fact, People without boundary issues are not choosing their life at all. They're having other people's needs and desires and pseudo emergencies dictate their life. Even pastors with good boundaries, even people with good boundaries find themselves overwhelmed at times by various demands. But if you struggle with boundaries, you know it can make ministry and living out your calling difficult and unsustainable. Um, People with boundary, boundaryless uh, people aren't fully living. They find themselves simply reacting to others, reacting to their own mental health issues they could benefit from working on. Um, and so there's no way, like every person is different. There's no way I could tell you um, exactly what is happening with each person on this chat right now. But let me just list um, like a few kind of common things um, that I've seen. So um some pastors and most pe people have a part that is desperate for praise and affirmation that they never received as a child. And that keeps them running and trying to people please and achieve to finally earn others approval and affection. But that only results in pastors feeling frustrated when the church members don't pat them on the back every time they do something good. And you know, they don't do that. Um, so other people pleasers tell themselves they're doing it all out of love but then all of a sudden they blow up when they're not receiving the affirmation they want and they're bitter and result, resentful and they have no idea why they feel that way. So blaming it on others and the congregation um, when it's really our unprocessed issues and our work to do. Um, some pastors are deeply shamed um, by their parents growing up, leading them to eventually take on and turn that shame inward against themselves into an unhealthy and unrealistic drive for a kind of perfection that does not exist. And so they push that drive for perfection to keep their shame at bay um, onto the congregation who then internalizes it and gives the message back to the pastor uh, that the pastor needs to strive for perfection as well. Um, but as long as we consciously or unconsciously strive for perfection, we're always going to be frustrated. Here's another great quote um, by Richard War. We can try at great personal sacrifice to be um, perfectly righteous, a perfect friend, perfectly responsive, perfectly available, perfectly forgiving. But at the heart of our efforts must not lie the knowledge that by ourselves, we can do, heal, or correct nothing. The point is not to be perfect, but to perfectly leave Christ to do heal or correct in us what he will. Um, so here, so here's some more um, examples going on in pastors um, and, and people doing ministry. Some people have a part of them that hates feeling the uh, um, feelings of pain and solitude. So they are always running faster and faster, going, 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 trying to stay one step ahead of that pain. They start new projects and new committees and new service opportunities and new small groups. And they're trying to do it all because they're running from themselves. 
And so setting boundaries or creating times of rest only seem to bring up feelings that they don't like and want to avoid, causing them to work even more frantically than before. And these pastors um, and people in churches are literally like people, again, who suffer from addiction, like trying to numb themselves with activity so that they don't have to feel. Um, but the only way towards wholeness and healing is eventually to learn to sit with and move through those feelings rather than just run from them. Some pastors, if we're honest, um, and people in churches are driven by a deep need for security. Um, may, uh, maybe they've been A plus achieving students their whole life, were driven to work nonstop so they can move up on a large in a larger church, um, supposedly get more financial uh, security. But the energy they have spent their whole life working from is an anxious fight or flight response. And at some point, their body just gives up after they're driving themselves from this anxious place for too long. Um, so these pastors uh, have to do the work of sitting in and facing their anxiety and acknowledging it and over time finding a deeper sense of safety in God than the ultimate illusion of material security. Um, some pastors find a deep sense of purpose and meaning, uh, and this is the last one, um, uh, and identity when they felt accept, they accepted their call to ministry. And that's great. We need purpose. We need meaning. We need identity. But some pastors identify so strongly with their identity as pastors that they have difficulty accessing their other meaningful identities and upholding those as well. Yes, you can be called to a pastor. And also part of your God-given identity is to lean into and discover who God is inviting you to be as a parent, a neighbor, a poet, an artist, a singer, an athlete, a woodworker. I don't know what it is for you. Um, but Jung, the, the famous 20th century psychoanalyst, had this idea that the first half of life, we develop the parts of our personality that were encouraged by our parents and our culture. And then um, they're usually, but not always based on gender norms. And then the second half of our life, um, our role is to look back and develop those other parts that we had ignored or disowned. Um, I'm thinking of a friend who was a police officer, so he was forced in this role of being firm, stern, enforcing justice. And then in the second half of their life, they discovered this part of them that loved making crafts. And he would make like custom um, like clothing hangers and sell them at, at a farmer's market. And it's for me, it's a beautiful example of this person making the time to discover the fullness of who God created them to be. Um, and sometimes we can identify so strongly with this pastoral part um, that we have difficulty developing all of ourselves. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> well, that's that's quite a lot, Travis. Yeah, I'm so, I, I am so grateful. I am, gosh, you got... I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. My brain, I'm just so grateful for this conversation because as you um, eloquently pointed out many different ways, which we'll get to here just in a few moments, is that self-care, taking care of oneself, and ultimately working on um, eliminating and preventing burnout deals with much deeper things than the surface um approaches if you will so yeah. you, i heard you name quite a few things you talked about delegation um not over functioning that's a, I yeah love, that's i love yeah i love what you said about especially us well-intentioned people of faith how addiction to use that word in a non-clinical way uh how rescuing can be an addiction mm -hmm. and Overfunctioning can be in a being, and so I wanted to talk talk more. And I've got actually a couple of questions that were sent to me privately, so I'll say those yeah. on those folks' behalf. Wonderful questions. People are really thinking with us. But one thing I wanted to talk about is that I know pastors. I'm in conversation circles where pastors feel what you are getting at in many ways is this sense of having to be everything to everyone for many reasons, but a lot of it is job security. Yeah. Yeah. 
because as you know, in many churches, the people who hired you and your personnel committee, the people who hired you and keep you employed are your congregants. It's such yeah. a it's such a tough system to navigate. And so I didn't know if you had because um we're all there. I'm speaking for me. I we're with you boundaries and the ways that we model this this model we need to model this for our churches so that we can have a shift in culture yeah but i'm also wondering how right now and in, in advent we had um a, somebody earlier mentioned thank you um was it uh Dennis, thanks, Dennis. You have a baby due and you've had nine mm -hmm. funerals in six weeks. You're tapped out. I really heard that. Yeah. yeah. So, so wow. What do you what do you have to offer with um yeah. shifting the culture, but you also are just mm -hmm. hanging on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I mean, you're right, Jessica, like the shifting of the culture thing takes time. And yeah. there's like a um uh, like a feedback loop that happens of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, and who knows where it starts somewhere. It starts from you. It starts from the congregation. Who knows? Like someone's putting pressure on someone who then is putting the pressure back. Right. So if, if we can think of ways through your preaching, like what would it look like to do a six week series on rest? What would it look like to do a six week series on Sabbath and boundaries, et cetera. And then so that, um, uh, and encouraging the congregation to practice those things on their own and giving them permission um, because maybe maybe you or maybe the pastors before them have not given them permission because um, because those pastors didn't give themselves permission. And so if you can give them permission and they can experience rest and freedom, um, then they are more likely to accept it in you as well that's all oh, yeah i don't know do you have any other thoughts Does anyone oh, that's a and that's a beautiful answer and thanks travis i think too that's the beautiful part about a faith community having the courage to work on mental health and talk about this very subject and that uh faith communities have a radical uh, have an opportunity to be radically different from the world so yeah. practicing mm -hmm. what you are here sharing with us and teaching us sharing these new ways of doing life and offering permission and taking permission i know yeah. i struggle with taking permission personally yeah uh, these and groundbreaking things that most of us were not raised with right mm -hmm. what better place to practice it and not always get it right and it can be messy what better place to practice it with our church families right a place to be radically different from the world of uh no grace and terrible toxic mental health practices mm -hmm. and so forth thanks dennis for sharing yeah. um yeah and i haven't read i've heard that that book um a few times but i haven't read it yeah that's that's i'm gonna have to check that out myself Oh, great answer, Travis. Um, so yes. I have a couple of questions. Travis, so one person wrote me privately saying that um, with what we're talking about today, how, now this is a deeper question because we're talking about taking care of ourselves and, mm. and so forth. What do you do when you're also dealing with severe grief, like the mm. recent death? Yeah. Um, a person is wondering how to how to incorporate that when maybe your mental health is going through something like grief. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm just thinking like, um, you know, the Jewish culture has this tradition of is it a week? Like mm. when someone dies, like you don't do anything. You don't cook for yourself. You're not allowed to do anything for like a week. Mm. Um, and I wish I was more eloquent about knowing the name of that and all. But by like our society, um, you know, I had my my own supervisor in sanctuary counseling. His daughter died, and he got one day off of work. Oh, that is, um, it's um, yeah, it's disgusting, really. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm, yeah, I think. The things I'm thinking are one, acknowledging that this is hard for you because this is um, awful. The one, what you've gone through is awful and the society that we've set up that makes us continue to churn out 
and show up and look busy all the time um, is really sick. And so Mm -hmm. it's hard to be healthy in a really sick place. Um, And then the third thing I'm thinking is, um, yeah, it is not uh, your fault that you feel this way. Maybe that's the second thing also, but just like the guilt, any guilt or shame that you feel for feeling exhausted, um, any subtle messages you're getting from people like, it's been six weeks. I'm surprised you're still not better. Like mm. it, it's, it can take as long as it takes and there's nothing wrong with you that it's taking a long time. It's just um, what needs to happen. Um, a, a great grief book, maybe you know it already. Um, it's okay to not be okay. is a great grief book. There, there She has some critical um, stuff about Christianity. So if you can mm-hmm. kind of like read through mm-hmm. that and um, ignore it or, or do what you want with it but a lot of really good stuff. Her husband died unexpectedly, the writer. Okay. She's a counselor too. And there's like a workbook that you can work through. Yeah, but great. Mm, yeah. That's a great suggestion. Thank yeah. you, Travis. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know that's the thing. If I'm hearing if I'm hearing you correctly, that's what makes this work, the self-work so hard and rewarding is that we're always holding so much. And when we when we can learn to lean into giving ourselves permission to rest yeah. and giving yeah. ourselves yeah. permission yeah. to offer grace to ourselves. Yeah. Um, it'll help us <clears throat> more in the moments or in the seasons of grief. And when those big things happen, right? Yeah, and totally. And there's nothing wrong with someone for needing to grieve. Like that's the most natural yeah. thing that there is. It's yeah. the most human thing. And that our culture won't let us do that is like deeply problematic. Yeah. Right. That's a wise, wise statement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Travis. Another person, somebody asked too. Okay. I'm going to just read this verbatim. Ask if you are with someone that is in that self-sacrifice mode, how do you kindly help them see this? So mm. the question is, is how do you, how do you share or point out to a loved one that they are running themselves uh, ragged, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, it's so uh, like without knowing, I think, so one of the things I'm thinking is just the the dynamic of of trying to um, help someone else can quickly become trying to rescue someone else. Um, and that's really sets, um, everyone up for failure. So, um, mm, I, I think doing it yourself and talking about what you're learning, not saying you need to do this, but just saying, this is what I'm doing. And I'm discovering this really important lesson about myself. And so someone else, when it's time, they might pick it up or they may not. But um, yeah, and I mean, it's the same way with, um, I think like discipleship with, with children, you know, like we share our own faith and what we're learning and allow the kids to kind of pick it up. But, but if we start saying like, oh, like you need to see a counselor, you need to read this book, you know, um, people aren't receptive to that. So just you doing, doing the work yourself and sharing what it means to you with no expectation on the other, other person, just as a desire to just share this amazing thing that's happening inside of you. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's not a satisfying answer because you want to fix the other person, but we can't. Yeah. Right. No, no, Travis, I think that's a great answer. I couldn't agree more. Alicia took the thoughts out of my mind too, with what you're saying is the modeling you're saying, modeling. And that's the thing um, with our work in faith communities. One way our health ministries help our overall faith community is that it's a way to say we're working on this we're talking about this even modeling when you're not intentionally when you think maybe 
you don't have it all figured out or it's not yeah. ready to go, mm -hmm. or maybe you feel that your health ministry or your projects are kind of bumbling along, if you will, there's still this modeling the seed planted. And so a little goes a long way. I mean, mm -hmm. goodness gracious, I remember the first time um, I've learned about the concept of boundaries and it, you know, that seed being planted it has only grown and I've learned here and there and put it all together and learning every day. And I certainly do not have it figured out, but thanks to all this, all the modeling that has been shown to me in the seeds planted, I'm able to hear and learn more than I could five years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah. That's great. Um, what has helped me is walking along yeah mm -hmm. with this examination yeah mm -hmm. um oh man yeah. <clears throat> mm. i don't know if you see the chat travis Some yeah i do yeah i'm thinking yeah uh, in terms of like uh, telling someone else it's so difficult I, I would say at most like maybe one time and that's mm. it and then they know it and that's, and that's it. If you, if you come back a second time, um, okay. yeah. And what, mm, yeah. And I'm wondering, it's like, I want, I want this for you so bad and you need to live your life, you know, and come to it in your time. Yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great, Travis. Thank you. And, and just, sorry, just what happens though is, is if we try too hard to rescue someone, so someone, like we see someone as the victim, we're trying to help them, then if it, someone tries to, um, like they try it and they're like, well, it didn't work. And then now they become like the persecutor that's like, they're upset at us. And then we become the victim in that moment. So it just like, it's so difficult to, to try and help people out of those situations because it can get caught in that cycle. And sometimes, sometime maybe we'll, you should have someone to just give a talk about that triangle of Cartman's drama triangle of what it's called, the rescuer, persecutor, right. and um, victim. Cause it, yeah. Um, do you have maybe, that would be a great resource to share in our follow-up email. Yeah. If you have that triangle, if there's like a document yeah, or um, that yeah. would be really cool. I think for folks to see now that you've mentioned that that's a great resource. It's a great um, book on Amazon. The book by, let me find it real quick. The book by the guy is like 40 bucks. It's like, that's oh, too much, but there's yeah. like a, a $10 <laughs> yeah, book. A lot. That's um, a $10 book that like explains it. That's really good. That's thank uh, you. Thanks for helping us dig that kind of stuff up. And um, Tamari and Mary, thank you all for what, what you chimed in is Dennis and Alicia. I appreciate all the comments. This is this is terrific. The compassion cycle as well to as an answer to the drama triangle. Thank you, Mary. Mary's also one of our good friends, PhW friends, who's a professional counselor. So we we'll oh. always appreciate Mary. I don't know the compassion cycle, Mary, okay. if you want to mention that. Yeah, I'm going to have to stay this chat and do a lot of Googling. <laughs> I have a, um, well, Travis, is it okay if I bring up another? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have another comment from somebody. Oh, thanks for putting that in the chat. Thank you. Apartment drama triangle. I oh, have yeah, another... Sorry, this this book also has okay. some very critical things to say about Christianity. So just know that going in, you know, do it, do it, care for yourself the way you need to, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of really good stuff too. Oh, totally. Yes. Thank you. So I have another question that was um, sent to me. This is, so we're talking a lot about in the faith community context, but many of us on this call don't work as yeah. a pastor in a faith community, many of us have all types of settings. And so yeah. in this situation, we're talking a chaplaincy situation. Yeah, that's this, right. yeah. this person says they work with a poorly boundaried supervisor who has unrealistic expectations, meaning this supervisor does not okay. follow it themselves. Okay. And so, um, and then ironically, this person who shared this comment is involved with a faith community 
that they pastor, it seems, that do have the realistic expectations and kind expectations. So it seems mm-hmm. that they have it going on at their faith community in a good way. But unfortunately, in their professional, other professional settings, they don't. So I appreciate that comment as a reminder that um, this is a, applicable to wherever you work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, I mean, the, the, I think the only thing that we can do is to um, honestly articulate our own, like what's going on inside of us, our own needs and where we're at without making it, it's not the other person's problem or it's, um, you know, it's not something they did to us. They're not the problem. It's just, I need to share what's really going on with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really struggling because um, X, Y, and Z. And I really want, I want to do a good job. And I just, this is what I'm dealing with inside of me. And if the, you know, and I would hope uh, maybe it would open up a good dialogue, ideally, where the chaplain then is able to hear, the supervisor is able to hear, and then ideally would share what they're, what's going on with them. Like, is it their pressure that they're getting put on? Who knows? But um, an authentic conversation begins with us sharing what's happening in us. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some good, and uh, um, and this is like stuff um, from like, I'm thinking of like Gottman marriage therapy has like good mm-hmm. conversation tools. Um, so maybe I could like scan a um, sheet that's just like about how to have those conversations if, which is a little different because it's a supervisor, but but just like, what does it look like to share from my position mm-hmm. instead of like making the other person the persecutor? Wow, that's a thought. That's, uh, yes, any um, Gottman Institute, that's a great resource for folks. Uh, I, mean, I don't have the link handy, but you spell Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. Is that I think right? So, yeah. yeah this, Gottman this, is, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a wonderful resource that I've used personally. So I vouch well, for yeah. that. And, and Travis, that's great. So what I'm hearing, if I'm hearing you correctly, essentially what we need to do is whether it's with a boss or with a, with a congregation or with a friend or spouse, finding ways to say what we're needing. Yeah what we're needing in a way that's that's appropriate for the relationship yeah. of course or yeah. The, um, um yeah i'm just thinking like um this is slightly a different example but you know i have a friend that came over to watch a world cup soccer game and i just yeah. like have trouble um connecting with him and i and it keeps happening um and i just thought like the thing i need to say rather than saying like you know you don't have the emotional skills necessary to have a good conversation is like what would it look like for me to just say, I, um, I really want to connect with you. And I feel like I'm not sure how I can do that. You know, and it's Mm -hmm. not his problem. It's me. Like I'm trying to figure out how I can connect with you best. And I don't know. Yeah. And for me, that hits a lot different than like saying you, you need to figure out this is your issue. Yeah. Right. Wow. We are, gosh, Travis, I am so grateful for you because I knew, Uh I knew when uh, you accepted our invitation, you were going to help us get, get deep. And you have certainly done that today. I just want to, if anybody has um, any more questions, put them in the chat. Yeah. I know that um, we'll have to wrap up here in a few moments. I have one last question that may be helpful for folks, particularly in the pastorate. But I just want to make sure I've already talked a lot. So if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah. And, and I, uh-huh. real quick, just to mention, I, I have a newsletter that I write um, yes. on travisjeffords.substack.com. Um, so I write every two weeks, um, about the intersection of like faith, spirituality, mental health, and the church, kind of all of those things. Um, yeah, if you're interested, feel free to check that out. Great. 
Well, one last question that I would love just to hear a little bit more on Travis, and you definitely went, you went, you, you, you helped us get there. So something I see with working with faith communities who are trying their best to work on mental health is that it is no secret that mental health resources and uh, access is difficult. It's just really hard. We are North Carolina. We are woefully underinsured or yeah. there's lack of um, affordable resources. And so that said, I'm backing up even more here. Referrals are really difficult for pastors. One, in seminary and divinity school, we have not often been trained how to do an adequate referral. Yeah. And, and secondly, with that, there the job security and just us as people who are com who are concerned about our people, we're protective of our people. We have a hard yeah. time often getting our people to the needed resource. We also feel that need to be everything to everyone yeah. but but also the the issue is is that there's a lot of times where faith leaders are acting out of their professional ceiling mm -hmm. and it can be it can be sometimes dangerous and so mm -hmm. i'm i'm i want to make sure we touch on this today um with referrals you offered practical in a personal relationship kind of way offering advice once that was kind of what you were saying but with a with a as being faith leaders and so forth, do you have any thoughts on referrals as far as like what when does it when do you feel it's need when is a good time a barometer to know to pass it on? Mm, yeah. Um yeah, so I mean you you said like definitely bring right when it's when it's outside of your scope. Mm -hmm. is just the the great thing and um and what i would recommend looking for is someone um who is um state board licensed yes. it's just such a so the kind of the letters that you're looking for lcmhc lcmhca i'll write these in the comment um so those are like counselors social workers um lc um s wait SW, LC, SW, LC, SWA, um, like MSW, no, what's the, yeah, I know what family, you're marriage and family, like MF, thank you, thank you, thanks, Mary, Mary does, yeah, Mary knows, <laughs> LMFT, um, <laughs> yeah, look um, for those, <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, like, there are, um, Christian counselors that, and not to, not to knock on anyone, um, some of them I'm sure are awesome and great, mm -hmm. but there's no, it's kind of like, um, the wild west in, um, you know, I could just buy a website and now call myself a counselor. And that's like really not any more helpful than they probably have less training than you do as a pastor. Mm -hmm. Um, so someone with those initials, um, LMFT Mary, who also, um, yeah, like can understand, um, the Christian tradition is probably what you're looking for. And, um, and I, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with like seeing someone that's not a Christian. I just think sometimes, um, we can, um, someone can subtly and subconsciously bring their own bias into the counseling room in a way that we all do and the way that I do, um, without realizing it. And so, um, yeah, finding someone who shares those values and has that like clinical research experience um, mm -hmm. for me is key. And Sanctuary Counseling Group has all of those things, but. Right, yes, yeah, so thanks, Travis. Yes, and, and thank you, Mary. Gosh, thanks for helping us um, think through things too. Yeah. In reading her comment. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Mary yeah. is awesome as well. Um, that's a wonderful thing about conversations like today, Travis, is that you, our people, we've got awesome people in the PHW network and we care, cool. we care for one another. So thanks for helping us. Yeah, referrals are important and partners in health and wholeness. We actually have a referral training for mm -hmm. pastors and, and leaders, lay leaders to think outside the box of the, the old way of doing referrals and a new way that's more sustainable and productive mm -hmm. and helps prevent burnout. So yeah, reach out great. to us if you're interested in learning more about that. But 
Thank you, Travis. What a conversation. Uh, I know I'm not alone in saying how grateful I am for this was an hour well spent, mm. to say the very least. And yes. I hope, nice. hope that um, all of us today can take your words and wisdom in the conversation and just go back into our lives throughout Advent, but ideally beyond Advent and, and to help think more intentionally about why do we do the th what why do we do things the way we do and yeah. maybe there's a more healthy way of doing that and so i'm so grateful for everybody on this call and um, i'm going to pass it over to uh, elizabeth who's going to help us center ourselves help the land the plane as we say goodbye to one another so um, but thank you again everybody for joining and thank you travis and thanks elizabeth Yes, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, we have a little tradition here at PHW to end our webinars with three deep breaths. So I invite you to get comfortable, feel your body in the chair, notice if you have any aches or pains or are you holding on to something a little too tightly in your body. Uh, if you feel comfortable, close your eyes and I'm going to count us off on the first one and then take the other two at your own pace. So. One, thank you all so much for being with us today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and be checking your email for a recording of this video and all the resources that were mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you.